This is our last lecture before the break. It's quite exciting. I was uh, on Tuesday night and Wednesday thinking a lot about the course and thinking how it's changed. How at the start of the course I was completely freaked out by everyone's um, the, the sort of level of C programming in general. Uh, does it seem flashy? That thing up top. It does seem flashy. Ooh, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> and I, was just concerned, I was just generally concerned about the course, and probably I'd say for the first half of this period before the break, I've approached each lesson, planning it with um, some anxiety in my uh, mind, wondering how I can progress the aims of the course while at the same time making sure we uh, sort of solidify the gaps that I, I thought we, we might have. But, uh, just in recent conversations with tutors, with the way everyone's going with the labs and the Spring Festival of Coding, and just the general way the course is going, I've, I've become very optimistic and happy over the last week, I guess, thinking that we've sort of achieved... I, I'm now really happy with where everyone is. I think the coding is at a good spot. Uh, some people are still working on improving their coding, but I can see they're working on it. And most people are where I'd like them to be. And now we're focusing on the... Um, you know, I can... I feel happy that we're just really focusing on the fundamentals of the course. And... At the same time, we've managed to cover a fair bit of the course so we can relax a bit now. There's not the mad sort of rush we had initially to get things out before you needed to start working on assignments and use them. We're now in a, a more leisurely thing, so it's actually a really nice place to be. So with that in mind, I've worked out some fun things you can do over the holidays if you'd like, if you just want to pause and have some fun, and I'll tell you about them at the end. Uh, uh, once you've got task two done, or, or instead of working on task two, if you get tired of task two at any given time, First of all, reasoning. More from Lewis Carroll. No shark ever doubts that he is well fitted out. A fish that cannot dance a minuet is contemptible. No fish is quite certain that it is well fitted out unless it has three rows of teeth. All fish except sharks are kind to children. It's a universal, universally held to be true. No heavy fish can dance a minuet, of course, and a fish with three rows of teeth is not to be despised or at your own peril. So you now um, put those together and draw a conclusion. And I'm hoping that you're uh, beavering away while we're doing the rest of the course, you're beavering away on your proof and reasoning skills because as you've probably noticed, task two is a reasoning task. In task two, if you have to make any shortcuts, you have to justify your shortcut. For example, sorting networks. We looked at sorting networks a couple of weeks ago, and there's a, um, a lab question which requires you to uh, create an ADT for a sorting network. And then there's a brownie point question that asks you to do some computations with sorting networks and find sorting networks that sort accurately of various sizes. And you might naively think, I mean, you, not naively, you might, your natural starting position would be that to work out of a sorting network of seven items, say, to work out if that correctly sorts seven items, we have to try all possible permutations of seven items and test it for each individual one to see if it works. You might think that's the best. And you also have to, I guess, look at equalities. Though perhaps you can do a bit of reasoning and logic and convince yourself that equalities don't matter so much and you can omit them. Or, or maybe you can't. I'll leave that for you to think about. Um, so you might think, gee, so with n things, uh, I have to do n factorial work. So verifying a large sorting network, each network would, seems to require a lot of work, and then verifying them all, that requires a huge amount of work. But actually, a result has been shown called the 0, 1 result. And you might have had it presented to you by your sorting network presentation in labs, in chutes, when the person, one of your chute members presented sorting networks to you. They may very well have mentioned this very interesting result. Does anyone know the result, the 0, 1 result? Is anyone aware of this result? The what? The 0-1 result. It goes like this, that someone has proved... Hey, guys, is it Jarrah? Shh, 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 shh. See, um, 
someone has proved that if a sorting network is a correct sorting network, well, this is, this is the obvious half of the proof, not only will it sort all inputs correctly, but in particular it will sort all inputs only consisting of zeros and ones. So if you gave it zeros and ones to sort, so literally the string zero and the string one, and you feed in some combination of ones and zeros to each line, so maybe all lines get a one, or maybe all lines except the last get a one and the last gets a zero, or maybe alternate one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, zero. Clearly, if it sorts all strings, it will sort those strings correctly. Someone has very cleverly proved the other half of this, that if it can sort all of those strings correctly, it can sort all strings correctly. So to test it out, a sorting network, to see if it's correct or not, you only have to test that it can sort all combinations of zeros and ones. Now, if you can, how many combinations of zeros and ones are there if you've got seven things to sort? Two to, the power of seven. Two to the power of seven. How does that compare with seven factorial? It's much prettier. Very favorably, <laughs> it's much prettier. So to sort 100 things, you've got to compute two to the 100 rather than 100 factorial. Actually, they're both quite large, but uh, they're really of quite different orders of largeness. Now, that meant if this assignment was about um, finding sorting networks, you could use the 0, 1 result and not test every single possible input. You could just test zeros and ones. But were you to make that shortcut, that optimization, that reduction in the number of states you, in, uh, problem states you have to consider, you would have to accompany it with a proof proving that you needed to do that. Or in the case of the 0, 1 result, you could just cite that result and cite the paper it was published in, and, and that would probably be sufficient proof. So in your assignment now, I'm expecting you to use reasoning whenever you take some shortcuts. So if you ever say, oh, I never need to consider programs that look like this, so I'll save a bit of time and never consider them, then that needs to either come with a citation, not to Wikipedia, but to a real a journal article or something like that, or a proof from you that that's an okay thing to do. And the proof doesn't have to be an elaborate formal proof, but it has to be a correct and sufficient proof, and it's probably something worth bouncing off your tutor if you're not sure about what constitutes a sufficient and correct proof. Uh, but it can't just be a vague, I would like this to be so sort of proof. Okay, so uh, that's that aspect of the course. Now, in our last uh, lecture, we celebrated uh, loops, or we celebrated coming down out of the trees, really, and we looked at how the world changes once we move away from trees and what's possible. Uh, and that was sort of the end of hashing and the start of graphs, because with graphs, we're looking at structures that are flexible enough to represent trees and also to represent tree-like structures that have loops. Uh, but I'd just like to say one more point about hashing. Well, and I'm sure I'll keep saying points about hashing each week as we go along. There's a fair bit of hashing we haven't covered, and I'm hoping at the end of the course, in the last week or two, if you notice in the schedule, it's given a fairly ambiguous names the last couple of weeks. That's because I'm hoping if we have enough time to spend that just going over all the stuff we've done and looking at funky extensions on it. And if we don't, then we'll just take it up covering the core stuff. But one uh, thing about hashing is we used hashing in task one in another way that I didn't mention in the last lecture. Can anyone think of another way we might have used hashing? We used hashing for testing the sort programs. But how else might... What's that? Characterizing. Uh, what do you mean by characterizing? <laughs> Sorry, putting you on the spot. <laughs> Oh, uh, for testing hash functions. Testing, uh, it wasn't for testing. We did use hashing for testing because we... Um, it was for performance. It was for, uh, um, yeah. No, well, uh, sort of. It wasn't really even for performance. It was just an unusual... It wasn't a hash table so much as, yes? Was it figuring who got what sort? Yeah, well done. Is it, it's not Richard, is it? Chris. Chris. Chris is a great idea. Where's Richard? Chris, you guys are sitting in a line. <laughs> so uh, it's confusing for me because I, I just... I, uh, no. <laughs> I remember people by their um, polar coordinates. Uh, and when I'm standing here, it's confusing if I remember any part of the thing. Okay, so yeah, that's exactly right. Do you want to elaborate how we would have done it? I mean, that's exact, it's sort of trivial when you say it. Uh, I guess you would have hashed everyone's name and you know, taken out all values. We took identifying information about each student. And like the student number or their login or something like that. And we, I can't remember what information, it doesn't really matter. And the number one, say if you were looking at sort one, we combine those two pieces of information into a hash function, which spit it out a number between one and whatever the number of sorts we had was, 18. And that was our hash algorithm. Uh, we, did, uh, we did something slightly more sophisticated than that um, to make sure we didn't get duplicates, but essentially that's what we did. So we hatched, hashed each student, and there's an infinite number of potential students we could have, but we had to hash you 
down to a number between 1 and 18 to work out what sort you got. And everyone got different sorts or different combinations of sorts or had the potential to. Uh, another thing I said in the last lecture was I was talking about mazes and I mentioned that my daughter had just recently discovered that in the particular maze book we were working through, if she did the mazes backwards, they were much easier to solve. And I... Um, I suggested that that meant you could characterize the mazes in that book as being tree-like. Oh, but actually, I'd like to pose a challenge to you, which is, can you come up with a better characterization of what mazes are easy to solve going backwards and harder to solve going forwards? What is the uh, important characteristic of such mazes? So that's just my challenge to you. Possibly, possibly, possibly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Try and characterize it somehow. What, what property would a graph have to have were it a maze to make solving it easy going backwards? Okay, so let's now look at some flavors of graphs. Just some of the terminology we're going to use when we talk about graphs. So from now on when we talk about graphs, you know what we're talking about. A graph is, um, oh, actually, I'll turn on light too. When we talk about trees, a tree looks a bit like this, got vertexes, got some edges, doesn't contain any loops. That is also a graph. A graph is a collection of vertexes, which we call, the collection of all the vertexes we'll just call V from now on. Ambiguously, sometimes we use the letter V to mean the number of vertexes in the graph. Sometimes V actually means the, the size of the set V, the cardinality. And E is going to be the edges. So this contains vertexes and edges. Each edge has to go from a vertex to a vertex. Yep, all these edges satisfy that. So that's actually a graph and a tree. But graphs are more relaxed than trees. They're not all uptight about rules. So this is also a graph. The same set of vertexes, one less edge. It's a graph, uh, but it's clearly not a tree. In fact, this is a graph, the discrete graph. And this is a graph. Now, if, every, if uh, a sequence of, if you start at a vertex and travel over the edges, um, uh, uh, starting at one vertex, uh, traveling to an adjacent vertex, and a vertex is adjacent if there's an edge connecting them. From that vertex, traveling to an edge adjacent to that and so on. The sequence of um, uh, edges you follow is called a path. If from every node there is a path to every other node, we call the graph connected. So this is a connected graph. If I wanted to make this graph unconnected, what's the minimum number of edges I have to cut? One. Which edge would that be? So it wouldn't be this one, would it? If I cut this edge out, the graph's still connected. What other edges could I cut out and leave it connected? I could cut this one out, still connected. I could cut this one out, it's already connected, still connected. But still a graph, but now it's no longer a connected graph if I just take that one out. OK. Um, all right, so self loops. A self loop is an edge that goes from a vertex to itself. Um, sometimes when we're talking about graphs, there's so many different sorts of graphs. There's a few different sorts of trees, aren't there? They're not necessarily binary trees. But graphs, there's just as many different flavors as you want to think of. Mathematicians have been studying graphs for hundreds of years, and they've in invented all sorts of variants and flavors. Um, they're a nice way of representing problems, which is why we uh, analyze them and study them. And depending on the different sorts of problems, there's different characteristics we want. So sometimes when we say a graph, we implicitly mean no self-loops. And sometimes when we say a graph, we allow self-loops. Um, I'll say from now on that unless I say otherwise, when I say graph, I'm not including self-loops. Self yeah, no self-loops. So this is a graph. What I had there a second ago wasn't a graph. This is a graph too, isn't it? 
two parallel edges. Um, but again, we're not going to consider graphs which contain parallel edges as being graphs unless I explicitly say so. They're called multigraphs if you're allowed parallel edges. Shh, 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 shh. There's muttering and mumbling. Is that because half of you have done a mathematics course where you've talked about this? Discrete mathematics? And half of you haven't done discrete mathematics? This is a delightful position we found ourselves in. Wave at me if you've done discrete mathematics. It was math 1131. Okay. Wave at the camera if you haven't and say, hello, Shri. Can anyone just turn around and look at the camera? Wave at the camera and say, hello, Shri, if you haven't done discrete. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, sh 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 I'm going to show that footage to Shri, by the way. Uh, <laughs> Shree's the man that said you didn't have to do discrete maths. Uh, so it is causing us a slight problem. Uh, so a graph is directed if the edges have a way you can travel on them, if they've got an orientation to them. This is a directed graph. What I had there a second ago wasn't a directed graph. Interestingly, now it's a directed graph. It may not. It may be an acyclic graph. Maybe we've lost our cycle. Can anyone see? Are there any cycles left in there? Oh, here's one. So there is a cycle. Is it? That's not a cycle. Oh, it's, <laughs> that's not a cycle. That's not what I meant to say. Can anyone see a cycle? No. Uh, uh, no. Killed all the cycles. There you go. Um, sh 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 call me the RTA. Uh, is it connected now? Hmm, I don't know. Maybe we need to have a special definition of connected for directed graphs. But certainly for the definition I've given you, it's not connected now. Sometimes the edges have weights and sometimes they don't. Oh, by the way, so when I've drawn a tree before, whenever we've done trees before, they've sort of been implicitly directed, though I haven't said it. Whenever we've done binary trees, because Every vertex knows who its parent is and who its ch ch children are. So there's an orientation on every edge going from parent to child. But an, a, a, a graph that's a tree like this, I can draw it undirected. And now there's no way of knowing who's a parent and who's a child. In fact, if you wanted to characterize a binary graph, a binary tree in a graph, a binary tree is, well, how would you characterize it? It's a graph which is, what properties does it have to have? Connected. It has to be connected. <laughs> oh, zero. Yes. And what else? And one more property. Uh, no, I'm looking at an undirected, uh, in an undirected graph, what would a binary tree be? What's an equivalent? If we embed it. It's acyclic. Thank you very much. Directed. Acyclic. Binary tree means... No vertex has more than three edges coming out of it. The number of edges coming out of a vertex we call the degree of the vertex. So no vertex can have a degree greater than three. A connected parallel edges, uh, vertex and node. Oh, well, we say vertex. When we're talking about trees, we sometimes use vertex and node interchangeably to talk about these blobs. But in computing, we tend to now talk about a vertex when we're talking about the thing abstractly, and a node when we're talking about how we implement it. So in your code, it would be a node. On the blackboard, it's a vertex. And similarly, in your code, these things are called links. But on the blackboard, we call them edges. OK, you got it. All right, so that's all the jargon we're going to need for a while. We'll, we'll keep coming across new variants and flavors of graphs as we go, and, and I'm sure we'll get new definitions popping up as we talk. Uh, did, 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 adjacent and degree. We've done everything. Woohoo! All right, so a quick quiz for you. Um, uh, what does degree mean? No. <laughs> Excellent. That's what I like to see. So it lasted for 12 seconds, didn't it? And then it faded away. OK, so that's um, the definitions. All right, representing. How can we represent a graph? In a computer, well, there's as many ways as representing as there are of spelling representing. But just two of them, the two most common ones, 
How would you represent it? I've asked you to represent a graph in the computer. How would you do it? You know how you do a tree. How do you do a tree? Series of, what do you, how do you represent a tree? You guys tell me. Series of nodes, which you just have as structs normally, and what else? And you have pointers from nodes to nodes. And to carry the tree around, what do you need? A pointer to the head of the tree. All right, so trees are fairly straightforward. There's no reason you couldn't embed a tree in an array. And later on when we get up to heaps, we'll see there's a couple of neat ways of doing that for particular applications. But normally we do it as a, a linked list. Well, a dynamic structure like a linked list but with two links coming off each thing. Okay, so that's normally how we represent a tree. That's pretty straightforward. There's not much scope there. But with graphs, there's a couple of ways of doing them. So here, hit me with some, just randomly. You can't be wrong. A list of links for each node. Um, so how do I know how many nodes I've got? I. You could have a maximum number of links from each node, and then you could just have whether that link was used. Okay, so we've got two different definitions. So tease them out. What's the underlying data structure you're using? Um, a linked list. Okay, a linked list. So we could have a linked list representing. Oh, let me have my diagram again. Let's draw the Southern Cross, because we're patriotic. <laughs> How is the Southern Cross linked? I can never remember. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's it. And uh, well, let's label the nodes um, A, B, C, D, E. Uh, How am I going to store the? And we'll give the edges names as well. We'll call it edge number, uh, what's that? Uh, one, two, three. Four, five, six, seven. All right, how am I going to store this guy? Eight? Uh, eight? No, it's not eight. Oh, uh, yeah, okay. Sorry, I should draw it like a circuit diagram. Could I draw this graph, by the way, without the lines crossing? How's it, what's another way of drawing it without the lines crossing? If I just draw it a different way... Yeah, yeah. If I just draw it a different way, if I renumber and and or if I renumber the edges, relabel the edges or relabel the nodes, that's called an isomorphic copy of the graph. It's the same graph we've just represented in a different way. So the graph I had before and this graph, they're just isomorphic. Okay. If you can write a, if you can, shh, 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 shh. if you can draw a graph on the blackboard without the lines crossing, what do we call such graphs? A planar graph. Planar graphs are very interesting to us. Because if you were using a graph to represent the wiring on a circuit board, suppose you've got a whole lot of components in a circuit and you've got to put them on the circuit board, then each leg of the component is a node. And sh 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 each track you have to put on the circuit board is an edge. I should say each, each, each leg is a vertex. And each track you put on the board is an edge. And when you're actually assembling the circuit board before you put the components on, when you're putting the tracks on it, you're laying the components out in such a way normally so that what? Tracks don't, cross. tracks don't cross. Because if the tracks cross, it's really expensive to manufacture the board. You have to do it in multiple layers or put things on the top and bottom or put jumpers across. Or, you know, that's time and money. So you'd really like to rearrange it so there's minimum number of crossings. And if you can rearrange your components in such a way that there's no crossings, woohoo, you're as happy as can be because it's really cheap to make. So in engineering, in electrical engineering, we're really interested in planar graphs. We'd really like to know, once you've come up with some crazy circuit and you've drawn it out and it's got lines crossing all over the place, we'd really like to know if the computer can rearrange the tracks in some way so it's an isomorphic copy of the graph, but it's planar. I mean, but there's no crossings. In other words, we'd like to know if the graph is really planar. A graph is planar if you can draw it that way. So, uh, yeah, we really like planar circuits. Okay, so look at this graph here. How are we going to represent it? Cliff, your way. A contains a list of pointers. What pointers does it... Oh, hang on. That's four, isn't it? So A is going to contain what? Uh, it's going to be a, a linked list. And it's going to contain what? It's going to contain one. And then it's going to be a pointer to another one. And it's going to contain two. It's going to, it's unfortunate this linked list is looking a bit tree-like, isn't it? I mean, it's a, bit, <laughs> it's a bit like the graph. And that's going to point to... Three, say, and then that's going to be a terminal thing. We'll have a null at the end. And B is going to have, what, a link to a couple of things as well? A link to a node that says uh, four, 
a link to a node that contains a well it's all it's all yeah hmm. I don't know that that's such a good way of representing it because now I don't know what well I guess if B connects to B has a three on it and it also has a seven on it this is a fine way of representing this structure, uh, I guess. We haven't yet looked at where we're going to be storing the A and the B, but suppose we could store the structure in this way. That's fine. Really, the question you have to answer when you're thinking about how you're going to store a data structure is how's it going to be accessed? What's, uh, well, how big is it going to be? How much memory is it going to consume? And then how are you going to access it and what's important to do quickly? So, for example, what's a question I might want to ask? I might want to say, um, is there a link from A to B? Now, how can I determine if there's a link from A to B uh, using this data structure? I have to search the links in A and search the links in B and see if any link of A occurs in B. Done badly, that would be like N squared, wouldn't it? Or well, well, like MN, if that's M and that's N. Done badly, I have to search through both lists. Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, this is a fine way of storing it, but it's an inefficient way of answering that question. And it turns out that's a question we often want to ask. And if I wanted to say who's A connected to, woohoo, then we're in big trouble. Because I know the names of the edges on A, and now I have to search through every other node in the graph, through all of their edges, to see if any of them have the same numbers as the edges, numbers on A. So if I wanted to ask the question, tell me every... Um, vertex that the vertex A is connected to, that would be a very expensive question to answer if the graph got big. And unfortunately, that is a really common question to ask too. So this data structure doesn't support that sort of query very nicely. But we can modify this very slightly and make it do it. And I'm sure everyone's just itching to call it out. Someone, put up your hand if you're itching to call it out. Yes? Uh, just put, where's the destination? Put the destination. So you could say um, A... Uh, Instead of even saying 1, what about I just say A connects to B? A connects to E. A connects to C. And B connects to A and E. No, it doesn't? Yes, yes it does. Yes, it does. I was thinking it's been rubbed out, but no. It's there and connects to C. Okay. Yeah, okay, so that's another way of doing it. Now, I've lost the edges as identities. The edges have disappeared. I'm just storing connection information between vertexes now. That's okay if the edges don't have any properties that I need to keep hold of. Later on, though, if I gave the edges names or I needed to know they were oriented or they had a length or other properties like that, then we're going to have to store some information on the edge. But I guess that's easy enough. We could just augment this node and put any information about the edge we need to put in. This sort of structure uh, where there's a linked list for each... Um, vertex that tells you all the other vertex it's connected to. This is uh, a f one of the fairly common ways of storing a uh, graph. But how am I going to store all the vertexes initially? Where am I going to store A? Where am I going to store, like where all these first pointers get stored? Another list. So I could have a linked list of all the nodes and each node has coming off it a list of all the other nodes it's connected to. Yep, that's a fine data structure. Can anyone think of another data structure I could use? I could have a list of nodes and a list of connections. Yeah, that's another way of storing it. I could have something that just said, essentially, a list of edges and a list of vertexes. Yeah, yeah, I could say, uh, contain A and B and C. What does this one have? And D and E. And then I could have another list that stores um, A, E and A, B and A, C, and da, 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 da. Yep. Yep. That's a good way of doing it. Now, shh, shh. this data structure here is good for some things. If I have to enumerate all the nodes, I can do that easily. If I'm doing a sequential enumeration, then it's not costing me any more that this is using a linked list because I'm going through enumerating one at a time. And if I have to enumerate all the edges, shh, 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 shh. Oh, is that a computer game sound? <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> we were watching the video of the last lecture, and it's really funny. There's one guy sitting around here that spent the whole time playing a game. <laughs> and 
I, had an, I, I was agonizing about what to do about it, because normally I don't care what you do during the lecture, as long as you're not disrespectful to the people around you. Yeah, play a game or whatever. But in the video, I could also see all the students around them kept looking at it and couldn't help but look at it. So I actually think it's probably a rude thing to do, even though you don't realize it if you're playing a game. It's a bit like having the mobile phone and talking on the mobile phone. So if you want to play a video game, please sit in the back so there's no one behind you. Please don't sit down the front. I've asked the camera operators to zoom in on the screen of anyone playing the game because the game was more interesting than the lecture. <laughs> okay, so there's no problems with playing games if you want, but not if they're noisy. But the rule is we just have to be respectful to each other. So A, if I see you playing the game, it's slightly off-putting to me because I think, man, I'm less interesting than that amazing computer game. Uh, how can that be? Uh, but also it's off-putting to anyone sitting behind you in the line of sight. So anyone playing a game now, please stop right now. And if you want to have your laptop open doing something interesting on it, sit at the back. Yep. Yes? Can you just turn that into a tree? Can I turn that into a tree? Yes, I could. How? Um, sure. How? So I guess we've, we're still in this ill-formed state where we don't really know the queries that are going to be asked on this structure. So I haven't really told you what sort of questions we're going to have to an be answering. So it's not immediately clear uh, or determinable what the most efficient data structures are. So let me tell you some of the queries now. I I'll come, come get to you in a sec. Don't let me forget. Uh, the queries we'll be asking are someone might say, tell me about all the nodes. Someone might say, tell me about all the links. Someone might be able to, someone is probably very interested in saying, given this node, tell me all the other nodes it's connected to. That's probably the most common question anyone will ask. Given this node, what are all the other nodes it's connected to? And sometimes we ask the question, given these two nodes, are they connected? That's, they're the most common queries we've got. What were you going to say? Just a two-dimensional array. A two-dimensional array. Yeah, now someone over here was suggesting that before. How would your two-dimensional array look? So this, oh, okay, so uh, can we just, um, just, let's deal with this structure before we move on. If we wanted to know all the nodes, this is really fast. If I wanted to ask the question, is this node connected to that node, I can just search through this, this list here looking for that connection. How long on average will it take me to answer that question? E on two. If E is the number of edges, it'll take me E on two to answer that question. It'll take me an E on, we call that, to answer that question. Uh, if it's in the list and if it's not, it'll take me E to answer the question. So it's a linear sort of question. So asking that question is a linear time and we can probably do a bit faster. Uh, but it's, it's still not bad. And if I wanted to say, given a node A, tell me all the other nodes it's connected to, how much work do I have to do? Again, I have to do E. I have to search through this whole list unless it's sorted or something like that. Um, so yeah, so those two things are each taking me E. Um, we can do better. This is a fine data structure for a, a different problem. Yeah, so your one was used an array. That's a good idea. Oh, we've done that again. Man, this is like the Thomas Crown Affair. Has anyone seen that film? Ah, it's a very good film. He does exactly the same thing. He steals a painting from a lecture by putting the pointer under the blackboard and then setting off the fire alarm. It's perhaps not so obvious when I describe it like that, but very clever. <laughs> a spoiler warning. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's a woman. Oh. <laughs> Okay, what are you going to put in the array? Uh, What's your name? I don't mean to point, it's rude. Sam. Sam. Oh, Sam, have we spoken before? Yeah, we have. Okay. Um, so, Nice. <laughs> now, if A is connected to A, that's a self loop, but if A was connected to A, we'd store one in here, otherwise we'd store zero. Is that what you're thinking? So how would we represent this graph? I'll just have to go up and down so with persistence of vision you can see both at the same time. I don't know how we're going. Oh, I know that. <laughs> there you go. It took a while. Um, 
So someone call out. What am I doing across here? Just call out. Um, zero. One. One. Zero. One. We like communicating, aren't we? This is how geek lectures go. Someone just walking in now would be going, what? <laughs> okay, B. One. Zero. One. Zero. One. And let's just double check, a reality check to make sure everyone's following. This last one here is one because B is connected to E. Let's double check that. B is connected to e. No, it's not. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, uh, I can uh, notice I can do a, a really sneaky trick here. And I can just actually write the reflection in straight away. OK, so let's keep going. And these are going to be zeros because I'm not allowing self loops at the moment. But notice this data structure would support self loops if we wanted to have them. Um, is C connected to D? No. Is C connected to E? Yes. OK. D, is it connected to, oh, well, uh, I get that for free. I get 0, 1 for free. I get 0, 1 for free. The only one I don't know is this. Is D connected to E? OK. So that's my structure. It's very nice. Notice, too, this would, direct, this would also allow me to represent a directed graph. If it's an un, we could say going from here to here is what the ones and zeros represent. Rather than answering the question, are they connected, it would be answering the question, is there an, an edge from here to here? At the moment, because it's an undirected graph, we've got symmetry around the central uh, diagonal, the main diagonal. OK, uh, that's all looking cool. All right, that's a great way of representing it. Notice, too, if we've not got edges with weights on, this is a fairly compact representation. Or is it? How much space is it going to take us? N squared. So the amount of memory it's going to take is N squared. Uh, say that more slowly on this graph here. Yeah, so A connected to B, instead of putting a 1 there, you could put 3. A connected to B, instead of 1, I could put a 3. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I could put its name in here if it had names, yeah. I could write their attributes in here. If it was a parallel, if we could have parallel edges, then I'm going to have to hang some ugly list-like structure off here. But if we've got a graph without parallel edges, if it's not a multigraph, then, yeah, anything I put in here is information about that particular edge. Then you don't have to have N squared. Don't have to have N squared? Because... Oh, yeah, I could just put it, um, repeated twice is actually <laughs> an example of doing that. Uh, so, uh, but, yeah, I don't have to repeat the information because what goes in one half of the triangle also lives in the other. But notice uh, that's still leaving it n squared, though, because, uh, yeah, n squared on two because we've got the big O. N squared. The big O, it's like one of those tourist destinations. <laughs> um, so, yeah, okay, so it's still n squared. A bigger, uh, the order of magnitude of n squared. The complexity is n squared. OK, how are we going? So we've got this. This is called an adjacency matrix. Adjacency matrix. Uh, adjacency because it's storing adjacency information and matrix um, uh, because it's a, a computer simulation of reality. And now let's look at the other way of representing it. We've got all these ways of fine. I just want to tweak this one. How can I make this one a bit faster? Shh, shh, shh. Use an array. Where? Yep. I'll make these guys an array because I know in advance how many uh, vertexes I've got. And now all this is now is a pointer. The first one is a pointer to the list relating to the first node. And the second one is a pointer to the edges of the second node and so on. Are you going to do it a different way? How? Well, I was going to have each one of those things on the, in the list as still as a struct, but inside the struct you'd have the array and then you could just have pointers to each of the other nodes. <coughs> Oh, I, I didn't get that. So you have inside each of the structs yes. the list. Yes. You have the name of whatever it is. Yes. And then you can have in an array pointers. To oh, the I see what you've got. Um, uh, so uh, a third way. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, I, if I'm, I think I understand what you're saying. Uh, I've forgotten your name again. George. George. Oh no, I've ne you've never said it before, have you? No. no. George. Uh, I think I understand what George is saying. George is essentially saying, why don't we just represent it like this? That's what you said. You didn't say it loud enough. <laughs> OK. Uh, uh, so uh, we're going to call this Richard's idea. <laughs> uh, this is a great way, uh, an interesting way of doing it. 
uh, depending on what problems you're solving, this could be the best way of doing it. It's, it's a very clever way. Actually, let's just malloc a node for each spot. I guess um, it's like uh, if we know the number of no uh, nodes in the whole graph, and that's fixed and not going to change, then every one of these structs in here could contain, an, um, and there's how many, how many vertexes are there in the whole graph? There's V of them. So this could be a, an array of length V here containing pointers to other things. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's very clever. Yeah, yeah I like that. So now we've got three ways of representing it. Normally, uh, the way people represent these guys is this way, edge list, this is called. Edge, uh, D, G, edge list. And this way up here, which is adjacency matrix. And this way here, we just let's just call it an actual uh, simulation. So this is the matrix. Just a matrix. OK, cool. Very good. Three different ways of doing it. Now, how much memory does each of these ways use up? How much memory for the first? Oh, we've already said that. Order n squared. Oh, n squared. n. Unfortunately, we've lost n. With lists, we had an n that was the length of the list. But there are two parameters that describe a graph. Well, at least two. What are they? Number of edges? Number of vertexes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. E and V. So it's O, what is it? O E, no, O V squared. That's a lot of memory if V is big. Yeah, what about this? How much memory for this way? Well, you need to store how many items in the array? V, items in the array. How many nodes are there? 2E. So it's order V plus E. We'd write that as? Because 2 is just a constant we kill. Which is using more memory? Which is using less? Depends. That's such a good answer. What's the most edges we could have in a graph? Non-parallel. In a graph, not a multigraph. And don't allow self loops. What's that? The number of edges are every. This guy can connect to how many? This is the handshake problem I gave you. He can connect to everyone. So he can connect to E minus 1. Uh, and he can connect to V minus 1. This guy can connect to, not counting that one again. V minus 2. Oh, let's count that one again, because I guess we've got to double count each edge. V minus 1, V minus 1, V minus 1. And how many of these are there? V. So it's V times V minus 1. So it's V squared on uh, V squared minus V. Uh, v squared minus V if we count each edge twice, or V squared minus V on 2 if we just count the number of edges. So there's approximate, the maximum number of edges we can have is the square is O V squared. Uh, this just comes up all the time, doesn't it? Isn't that crazy? So what's O V plus V squared? O V squared. So it's the same order. In the worst, it's the same order of um, uh, memory use as an adjacency matrix. But in the best, it's just OV. Like if I've got a, a graph with not many edges in it and lots of vertexes, we'd call that a sparse graph. Lots of vertexes but not many links between them. Then the matrix uses is it's fairly oblivious, isn't it, in how much memory it uses up? But the edge list shrinks because you don't need to store all those edges. So if you've got a sparse graph, often what people will do just as a default position is store it as an edge list. And a dense graph, often what they'll do is a default position and store them as an adjacency matrix. <laughs> that's, a good, that's good feedback to me, but um, <laughs> I've got to think of a more subtle way of doing it. Um, uh, so if you're really obsessed with memory and that's all you care about, that's probably a good way of picking between the two. But I suggest these days, unless you've got a huge graph, maybe memory isn't your main concern. Maybe speed. And in fact, even with a huge graph, speed becomes a problem at the same rate that memory does, if not faster. So I would suggest pick between the two representations depending on what questions you want to answer quickly. What question can you answer really quickly with this one? 
Is A connected to B? Given two specific nodes, are they connected? You can answer that in constant time. Uh, file systems, uh, no, they, they tend to be more tree-like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, oh, yeah, but they are chains in a table. Yeah, 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 in a sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A table of chains. Yeah, yeah. Um, sorry, that just threw me. Let me just get my thought back. Oh yeah, is A connected to B? You can answer that question. What question can you answer quickly down here? Which, Which one is A connected? Which one is A connected to? Give me a list of all the ones A connected to. All the ones A connected to, you can list them in the fastest time you possibly can, which is the number of ones A is connected to. No, that takes order V time to answer the question, what are all the ones that A is connected to? Yeah, yeah. Because above, I've got to go, if I want to know all the ones A is connected to, I've got to scan the whole way along. Whereas here, I only have to scan along as far as there are connections. You can't do better than this. Now, if for these two graphs, A was connected to three things, and there are only five vertexes in the graph, so it doesn't seem to make much difference. But you could have a thousand vertexes in the graph, and everyone could have, on average, degree four. Like so cells. this is only going to take, yeah, like brain cells, neurons. So this is only going to, your searches here are going to take about four, and your searches here are going to take about a thousand. But answering the question, is A connected to B, is much slower here than it is up here. Yeah, yeah. OK. Swings and roundabouts. Now, sh 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 let me just check the time. Oh, no wonder everyone's getting tired. It's nearly finished. It's nearly finished. And the lecture's nearly over. I, what, I've talked about memory. We've talked about, I haven't talked about searching. And I haven't talked about other stuff. All right. First of all, the bell. I brought the bell. I would like to know, sh 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 in your frenzy of coding this week, for the Spring Festival of Coding, who managed to get four questions right? Can you please put your hand up? I need to count how many people. One, two, keep them up. Three, four. You'll know if it's right or not. You'll feel it in your water. Five, six, seven, eight. OK, those guys there. Fantastic. All right, that's really well done. To those that haven't yet done four questions, what we've done um, under popular demand, <laughs> I won't say request, due to popular demand, um, you can do those four lab questions next week as well, so you get like another week to do them, but you don't get as many marks. Uh, it, the marks are reduced by 75%. So if you nearly finish them, oh uh, yeah, I always get those mixed up. Yeah. <laughs> reduced to 75%. <laughs> it's an undirected sentence, from and to. Uh, shh, 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 shh. Yes. Can you still get the brownie point? Can you still get the brownie point? Yes. And the other brownie point. You get only three quarters of a brownie point. But if you, got, if you, did, if you were worthy of. No, brownie points, brownie points stay open until we give answers to them. Ah, okay. So all the brownie point questions that have come up so far are still open if anyone wants to answer them. Yes. Shh, 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 shh. A very important question over here. Is that. You're wearing a soccer jersey. Is that kick the ball? <laughs> awesome. Oh, shh, shh, shh. If, if you've done three, can you do another one? The answer is yes. Oh, I see. Uh, yeah, do it and just sort it out with your tutor. And if you get it right, I've got a bell waiting for you. Okay, so you can, you can have a ting of the bell, or three quarters of a ting of the bell. A B-E-L rather than a B-E-L-L. -L. <laughs> Sounds the same. Uh, any more questions? Good questions. Okay. Um, Searching, play Fury in the holidays. Has everyone seen Fury so far? Let's flip to it. Here we go. Everyone quiet. Everyone quiet means everyone quiet. I'm going to do it. I feel like Austin Powers. Room full of Okay, here we go. Dracula. <laughs> um, now, as you know, as uh, hopefully you know, your challenge over the... Oh, sorry, it's too dark. It's too dark with such scary things like that. We'll make it a bit brighter so the lecture doesn't seem so bad. Uh, <laughs> Your, 
<laughs> <You're>... <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, your, your challenge over the holidays is nothing to do with coding. Okay, the project's not coming out till after the holidays, but we want you to play the game. We want you to get together with your partner, your lab par your project partner, because you guys will be doing this assignment <laughs> together. So get together with them, exchange details, and play the game so that when you get back from the holidays, because at the very end of the holidays, just after task two is handed in, actually, I'm, I'm going to be releasing the project spec. And there's something you've got to do in the first shoot back, which is really important. And if you get it right, it's going to make your life so easy. And if you get it wrong, it's going to piss you off beyond belief. Because in your first shoot back, you're essentially going to all in the shoot be talking together and committing to something. And whatever you commit to, that's what you have to do. So you don't turn up to that first shoot not knowing anything about the project, or you'll just be, I, I agree, I disagree randomly, and who knows if you're making life good or bad. So play the game a whole heap. Now let's just have a quick game of the game now. Here we go, the game. First thing you might notice about the game is, shh, shh, shh. is it a tree? What is it? It's a graph. Kaditz is connected to Lisbon. Lisbon is connected to Madrid. Does that make sense? It's a connected graph or not a connected graph? Connected. Is it directed or not directed? Not directed. Does it have any self loops? You don't know until you know the game rules, I guess. Okay, here's how it goes. Solid lines are roads. Dotted lines are, of course, train tracks. Large blue areas with dragons in them are sea. <laughs> You move, you are the good guys, and your tutors are the bad guys. In teams of four, cooperatively, you hunt down and kill your tutors. <laughs> I mean, Dracula. You hunt down and kill Dracula. Dracula is hiding somewhere in the 19th century. Here's the 19th century. We don't know where he is. You guys move around. So, for example, one of you might be Lord Godeming. One of you might be Mina Harker, uh, or uh, Buffy, as I like to call her. One of you might be Dr. Seward, and one of you might be the other one. <laughs> and together, all four of you are a fearsome force. How about the man, that should not be the man without a name? The man, yes. The, the, man, the man with no name. Now, yeah. Captain Hook. <laughs> okay, so what happens is here, suppose... Lord Godeming is in what country? What, where should he be? Madrid. He should be in Madrid. He's in Madrid. And Dr. Seward, where should he be? London. No, let's put him in Amsterdam. Oh, no, we put him. He's in the North Sea. <laughs> and Van, Van Helsing, where does Van Helsing go? So, the money, open the box. Castle Dracula? Is that a real country? Where is he? Strasbourg. Okay. And the last one is Buffy. In the hospital. Buffy's in the hospital. Barcelona. Barcelona? She comes from Barcelona. Where? No, a girl has to say where Buffy is. Dublin. Dublin. Oh, that's a cool place. She'll have an awesome accent if she's in Dublin. I was once hiking through the Himalayas and... All I'd been hearing for years were American accents. It was like entirely filled with Americans. And then suddenly this party of Irish girls walked past us, all speaking in that lilting Irish voice. And we just went, Whoa! And we just all fell in love instantly, just because of their voice. And we stalked them spookily through the Himalayas <laughs> till they stabbed us with spikes through our chest. That was an interesting story. Okay, so here we are. Now, we can either be on land or in sea. We travel round by road. We can also travel by train, dotted lines. We can also travel by ship. So I can go, if I'm someone on the coast, I can go from Dublin to the Irish Sea. And I can go from the Irish Sea to the Atlantic Ocean. And the Atlantic Ocean to Lisbon. Does that make sense? So you see the connectivity information from land to sea? Dracula cannot move by rail, of course. Dracula, oops, I'm killing myself. <laughs> 
Dracula, when he moves by um, uh, sea, he, he hates that. He, he doesn't like water. So it causes him all sorts of pain. What's the point of the game? The point of the game is to save the world. So here's how we do it. We have to find and kill Dracula. We don't know where he is. He's somewhere. We don't know. So we move around. It's Lord Godamine's turn first. He's in Count Dracula. He's in Count. No, he's not. No. We actually find out where he he's here. Can I show you on the map? We know where he is. Here's his history. He's here. This is where he was last. This is where he comes next. 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 And then he's on the moon. That's how it goes. So he's somewhere. We can see from this that he's not at sea. Because whenever he's at sea, we know. And were he at Castle Dracula, we'd find out straight away. But we don't know other than that where he is. We only find out where he is when we visit a node where he has previously been. And if we visit a, a node or a, a vertex where he's previously been, then, and it's still in here in his trail, it will get replaced with the name of where he actually is. So we get partial information and using algorithms, we work out where he is. Or using just our buffy sense. Okay, so let's go Lord Godaming, he's moving this way. And uh, it's highlight all the places we can go. Who's this that I'm looking at here? The guy who's in the North Sea, he can just land uh, on a port somewhere. So he might as well land in Amsterdam. And he, uh, Lord, uh, Van Helsing can go to Nuremberg. And uh, we can go to Galway. Uh, and, and now it's my turn again. And, we can, and Dracula's moved again. To where? We do not know. Paris. Paris could have been. Par Paris? Paris? Whenever you're given a choice. Par no. It's go we can travel to Paris. How can we travel that far? How can this guy travel all the way from here to Paris? Because he's traveling by train. Teleport. 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 <laughs> And Marseille, and I'm just moving around randomly shh, shh. for a little while. Oh, back to Munich. That wasn't very clever. Should she just stay in with this awesome accent? No, she should get out to see. Shh, shh, shh. Genoa, Genoa, and Strasbourg, and Zagreb, and uh, Lisbon, maybe, or the Mediterranean. Uh, she could have gone to the North Sea. That's right. Um, and Frankfurt, and uh, Munich. This is my random strategy. I hope a Castle Dracula, Budapest. Let's go there. I've heard that's really nice. Marseille. Now, oh, oh, what happened here? He's double back. Okay, so, for example, we know that Dracula cannot be in Caligari because he would have had to move somewhere. If he stays in the same spot, he can only stay in the same spot once. That's called hiding. But he, you can see, he's just stayed here for a long time, not doing anything. So he's not in Caligari. Could he be up here? Could be up here. What he's done is he's doubled back. So he's done this move, then this move, then this move, and this move. And his last move is doubling back to one of the places he's previously been. He's a tricky one. Let's just keep moving. Um, we're just hunting for him randomly. It shouldn't take long to find. Because at the moment, the Dracula we have in here is called Druncula. <laughs> and he's only moving randomly. So we'll catch him. He's got no intelligence whatsoever. Uh, not as my search strategy, but there's four of us. Ah! Look, Godaming found him. See, up the top? See the flashing lights? That happens when you find him. Lord Godaming has encountered a minion. Oh. He's been into Florence. Okay, so Lord Godaming just moved to... Where's Florence? Here, in Italy. And we discover that Dracula was in Florence for his first two moves. He must have gone there the first move and then hidden there the next move with a hide. So we know he was there a couple of moves ago. He's moved on one, then on one, then he's doubled back. So he could have gone to here, then here, and double back, couldn't he? He could have, he could have gone, well, he could have gone anywhere. We don't yet have enough of that. <laughs> now, Dracula, being not a nice guy, whenever he visits a city, he leaves a booby trap for us. Either a minion, which hurts us, or a vampire, which just sits there slowly hatching, as vampires do. And if the vampire stays in a city and we don't get into the city before that city, because you notice every move we're all just shuffling along here. If the, city's, the vampire's in a city and eventually he gets to the end and we haven't found it, then the vampire hatches and we have two vampires to find. It's a real pain. Or we just lose whole, lots of points. But if we find the vampire before it hatches, we kill it. Yes, does that make sense? Okay, so. 
We've now seen, I think, every complex thing about the game. The game is essential. Oh, should we just move around till we find him? Yeah. All right, let's just find him. We're nearly there. Everyone else, quickly get over to Italy. Uh, maybe, uh, yeah, Munich. He can't be in Munich. Someone's done some logic, but we're closing in on him. Ah, help! I'm too far away. Budapest. And I'm coming over to you. I'm coming to Geno Geneva. And he's going now. Oh, did we find? He's in Castle Dracula. Oh, we know he's in. Ca How did he get to Castle Dracula? <laughs> we have seen. We have seen the. F I said we've seen every complex rule. There was one more complex rule that I didn't mention, and now we've actually seen it. If Dracula ever gets into a bind and it's physically impossible for him to move anywhere and not break the rules of the game, he magically teleports to Castle Dracula. So, unfortunately for him, we now know exactly where he is, which is Castle Dracula. He went down and there was no legal move. It can't have been possible. He might not know about the sea yet. Dracula might be a bit stupid. <laughs> Okay, does that make sense? Uh, and now we just, well, we might as well just catch him now. Let's get him. Everyone's coming across. Let's go. Here we go. Oh, now where could he be? He's not in Castle Dracula anymore. He didn't, shh, shh, shh. he didn't move where Van Helsing is, did he? Because Van Helsing's next to it, he was in Castle Dracula, he's not there anymore because we can't see him. Remember the rulers, you can see him wherever he's in Castle Dracula. So where must he have gone to? We must be here. Okay. No, he can't because we'd know he was there. Because as soon as he goes into a city where we are, we know he's there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we didn't find out where he was, so we know where he <laughs> Dracula, your evil ways are. Here we come, we're chasing him again. Notice, by the way, Lord Godoming encountered him and where's Dracula's... Oh, he hasn't got hurt yet. Now they're going to meet each other. It's not going to be pleasant. Boom! Oh, Dracula's lost some blood points. Lord Van Helsing isn't looking that good either. Does that make sense? And now we just all keep zooming in on him. Come here. Come here. Come here. Boom! We got him again! <laughs> now he's down to there. And we're... Dr. Stewart's not looking so good. And now we can get him again! Van Helsing, boom! Gets him. And now Dracula. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> oh, it's exciting. This is what real combat looks like. <laughs> and now we're coming to get you. You'll never escape us. And now we're going to move to Budapest. Dracula, if he's stupid, will move to the same place. Dracula is, has no wits, so he probably he has got an equal chance of moving there. What did he do? Is, He's gone to Zagreb or Bucharest? No, Zagreb or Belgrade. He could have gone to Bucharest, couldn't he? He could have gone to any of those ones. Oh, well, let's just go to them one at a time. Not that one? Why not? Oh, how do you know he's not there? Oh, he can't go back. Oh, good point. It's in his trail, is it? Galitz is not in his... Ah, so he's not... Ah, ah, he can't go there because he's not allowed to go back. He can't go to Galitz again as long as it's in his trail. He could go to Bucharest or he could go to Zagreb. Too many he can go to. We need to. We, this is what happened. In a scary movie at this point, what do you say? Let's, go right. Let's, split up. Let's all split up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're going uh, to Bucharest. Yes. Go right, young man. Didn't work, but we've ruled it out. That's a good thing to do. Van Helsing got teleported. Oh, poor Van Helsing. Oh, by the way, when we get back, when we get killed, we just go to the hospital and it's all good. But when Dracula gets killed, it's not so good for him. I mean, where are we going now? So he was in Belgrade. Sophia? Well, he was either there or there, and now he's moved somewhere. Let's home in on him. Oh, no. So we're coming across here. We're closing in on you, Drac. Oh, we discovered him. Oh, no, we found a minion. That's where he was. So he's in Belgrade last move. He's either there or he's... Or, no, we just moved from there. He didn't, wasn't there. We would have found him. So he's there. Oh. oh, what was wrong with my logic? What was wrong with my logic? 
elementary. It's a grab, it's a grab. Yay! Woo! Thank you, guys. All right. So automate all that clever thinking you were doing then, and your tutors have no chance whatsoever. All right, everyone, we're going to take a break now. I'm going to have a real extension lecture after the break, not um, a pretend one. And we'll be talking about... We'll be talking about uh, cryptography, hash functions, encryption, randomness, entropy, shuffling, and craziness. And some fun holiday projects, including the Bible code. Oh, that one. Yeah. We always talk okay. about the Yeah, do they? Cool. It's an awesome book. <laughs> they always like, we always have a way to disprove it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's really good. Yes, yes. It's, it's a very... Disprove it. Yes. Well, we're going to be having a whack at it. I must admit, I have a Yes. Yes. I mean, there's always a way to disprove something. Yeah, I mean, we can certainly um, show that his reasoning is pretty specious in this book. Yeah. Like, um, like all these, 